Hello, I'm Janice Karen, Director of Policy, Technology, and Innovation at the Massachusetts Health Data Consortium, or MHDC. I run our Data Governance Collaborative, also known as the DGC. We start each of our weekly meetings with a series of industry quick updates to learn about new and proposed regulations, laws, standards, industry initiatives, and other activity. Join us for this week's updates. And if you'll go to the first update, please. Um, so CMS, CMS has provided some new tools around hospital price transparency. Um, they include an online validator as well as the command line validator. That's uh, a more automated scriptable approach to validation. Uh, machine readable file naming wizard that helps folks um, name their files in accordance with the rule and a text file generator that also helps them generate text files um, with, their, with their required attributes and metadata to help people have access to their machine readable files. So this is the text file that has to be at the top level of the website that um, tells people what the name of the machine readable file is, um, where, where it can, the URL where it can be found, includes a link and includes inform information about who to contact at the hospital if you have any questions. So you can find more information at the link provided. Does anyone here have any questions or comments? All right, then if we move on to the next update, continuing with price transparency related things. <laughs> um, there is a new report on the 2023 use of the independent dispute resolution process in the No Surprises Act. Um, public data was released in two tranches this year, covering 2023, and some researchers at Georgetown have analyzed the data and found some interesting things. Um, well, we've talked before with some of these updates about how the usage has been very high and higher than CMS was expecting. And that has, has caused some issues along with some of the delays and reconfiguration because of court cases. Um, so, so this data really supports that. Uh, you can see the, just uh, in basically a year, I'm actually looking at that, wondering if that was a typo and should have been 2023, but um, let's assume that it wasn't, uh, that, that, uh, that just a quarter's worth of disputes grew from basically 70,000 to like four and a half times that in a year. And it must've been from Q3 2022, that must be correct. Sorry, spacing out a little bit. Um, but that's a pretty big jump in, in a little bit over a year. Uh, however, the new filings dropped in Q3 2023. And this is because they assume this is because the process was closed down for a period of time because of some of those court cases that I mentioned. Um, but be that as it may, things were down that quarter and then went back up on Q4. Uh, about a third of the cases that were filed in 2023 um, were challenged as ineligible and just over 20% were found to actually be ineligible. Now, this is interesting. 70% of the new cases come from just four private equity backed organizations. However, two of them <laughs> represent a large number of physician groups. So it's not really fair to look at this as, you know, I looked at that into kind of a, a side eye, but, but when you actually dig into it, it's not really f fair to think of this as 70% of the claims came from four organizations because um, two of those four organizations are actually representing a large number of physician groups. So those claims were actually spread across a, lar a much larger number of providers. It's just that the organization that was processing and filing on their behalf um, was, was the same. But the other two are large part provider groups. So there were two, two large provider groups, one of them a radiology group that was part of this group of four. Also, more than 50% of all of the cases came from Texas, Florida, Tennessee, and Georgia. You may remember we, we had some 2022 data that we've looked at in the past, and there were actually five states 
And I tried to find the slide really quickly to see what the one that dropped out was. But there were, I know last year from 2022 data, there were five states that had the majority of the cases. <laughs> and this year there are four states. Um, Massachusetts had less than 1,500 cases throughout the entire year, to give you an idea. Out of the, you know, if it's 318 and one was filed in Q, just in Q4. So it's, it's a minuscule drop in the bucket. Any questions or thoughts or comments so far? All right, let's go on to the next slide where it continues a bit. Um, so of so so remember there were three hundred eighteen thousand new cases. They were able to resolve one hundred and four cases in that same time with payment determinations and seventy three thousand. So as you can see, they're not keeping up. Um, what's interesting is that pro of the cases that get adjudicated, meaning those that aren't thrown out because they're not eligible <coughs> or for some other reason, um, providers win a majority of them. And the success rate of providers actually climbed up to 85% by the end of the year. And when they win, they usually got over 300% of the offered payer rate. Um, the, the areas where there were largest, the largest differenti differentiation between what the payer offered and what the provider was given by the, um, by the adjudicator were in ED services, imaging, and neonatal pediatric critical care. And a quarter of the time, the, the provider was given at, five, at least five times the payer offer. And just under 10% of the time, they were given 10 times the payer offer or more. So there is some pretty significant differentiation between what the payers are offering and what the um, independent dispute resolution process is determining they should be paid in those cases where there is a winning determination for the provider. Um, the, the, the types of providers that tended to do best were radiology surgeons and neurologists, and also individual small practices fared better than hospitals in the challenges. So any questions or thoughts or comments on any of that? You can find some more information at the link if you're interested, and if there are no questions or comments, we'll move on. <laughs> So the last update for today, um, FDA has a new webpage about information on their research on AI and medical devices. It covers, this is just a sampling of what it covers. Um, well, the three areas are, are, are correct, but a sampling of line items under each. So some of the applications of AI found in medical devices and some of those include image acquisition and processing, early disease detection, more accurate risk assessments and therapeutic treatment response monitoring. Again, that's only a selection of the ones that they mention. <laughs> and what they're trying to do is fill in some gaps with the research. And so again, a sample of the things they're looking to do include enhancing the training methods when there's only a limited data set available as the training data, minimize bias in AI enabled devices, Create different, this one I thought was really interesting. Create different types of metrics and methods for evaluating the AI. And then also developing um, post-market monitoring methods for AI. So I think that third one from our perspective is really the most interesting because that's something that should in theory be widely applicable to all types of AI and not be specific to the types of things that the FDA might be dealing with. Although remember, medical devices in this context includes software. So some of these AI and medical devices are actual algorithms or pieces of software that are doing AI. So it's not, it's, it is more generally applicable across the board than you might think about when thinking about medical devices in your brain. So any questions so far? All right, let's go on to the second page of this. 
So they um, list a bunch of the current program research activities and they do roughly correlate to the areas that they wanna do research where they found the gaps. Um, but these are the ones that I picked up as most interesting there. Um, adjusting the limitations of medical AI data. I think that potentially could be very interesting. Um, identifying and measuring AI bias for enhancing health equity. Performance assessment and uncertainty quantification. That's tied to what I was just talking about on the previous slide. And I think that again, also has the um, possibility of being very interesting and wide rangingly useful. Um, regulatory evaluation of new AI uses. So that's also potentially interesting. And then again, tying into the last item that was on the previous slide, methods for effective post-marketing monitoring of AI and medical devices. So you can find the new webpage there. The, the current program research activities, and again, this is just a sample of them. Each has a link to more information about the, the current program. So if there's one of those that you're particularly interested in, you can go to this page that's linked here and then follow the links at the bottom of that page to any of these or I think there were eight or nine in total of the, the actual programs that are ongoing right now. Any questions, comments, thoughts here? All right, if you'll go to the next slide and pause. I hope you learned a lot from our quick updates. If you're interested in finding out more about the DGC and its other activities, email me at dgc at myhealthdata.org. That email address is also on your screen.